Here at RUSI, we speak to around 8,500 students who are in professional military education every year. 18 staff colleges around the world in everything from a single lecture to a two-week long work package. And on themes as diverse as Great Pack Competition, the Future of Alliances, or Hybrid Warfare Active Measures, the Deep Battle, or the Reality of Contemporary Conflict. We have a special relationship with Ecole de Guerre. In Paris, the students don't have a deeply intensive laid out syllabus, which they've got to crack through uh, during that year. They do that work before they get to the college. And as a result, the year they spend in Paris, they look at topics which are designed to exercise their intellect, to extend their idea of concepts of doctrine, to change how they think about great problems. We've been privileged to, over the past three years to set them a series of challenges every year. And in conjunction with the English department there, the students spend their year uh, looking at a selection of topics that we give them and deciding to write uh, a dissertation a thesis on one of those topics. The topics we select aren't necessarily those that uh, are around the big issues of the day. They're not even necessarily over the big issues over the next two to three years. But they are issues and challenges that we think need looking at. They're issues that might extend to 20 or 30 years out. They're conceptual and they're designed to stretch them intellectually, to bring something else to bear uh, as they go into the next parts of their careers. Now, normally, at the culmination of their uh, presentations, at the end of their academic year, the students present their findings and their paper to a panel who then challenge them, question them, uh, and generally uh, dig into some of the detail that sits behind it to really push them and challenge some of the debating skills. And again, they do this in English. What's even better is that we found that we have the support of both Vice Chiefs of Defence staff from the UK and France who make their way to London to Russie and join these sessions, each of which has been fascinating, challenging and insightful. This year, of course, that wasn't possible. Uh, it wasn't possible for the students to come to London to present or to bring people into a, a big room to do the challenge sessions. So we did it virtually and we weren't able to bring a whole variety of others to come and view uh, what they saw. So instead, we did it virtually and the attached presentations that you can see in the following clips are the findings of the students and their papers. The students are really to be congratulated for what they have delivered. It's uh, quite astounding not only that they've achieved this in a year, but in a second language and delivered a, a paper as well as a compelling and, 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 and good presentation at the end of it. The whole range of topics that we gave them for the last year were everything from the reliance on logistics, proxies in space, the morphing of cyber and space challenges, uh, contested theatre entry, but perhaps the two most interesting presentations that you'll see were on firstly the concept of parity in military terms and secondly uh, the changing rules of warfare and what they mean for the future. The students of both of these presentations really excelled themselves and we're really grateful to the support from Rob Johnson at CCW and numerous others who helped them through uh, what is a difficult intellectual period for them. We really enjoyed working with them and hope you enjoy the presentations that follow. Thanks very much for watching. The first research question that we sent the students was a broad theme around has the contractorization of defence gone too far? In explaining this to the students, we used the example of logistics. Military logistics, interestingly, since the pandemic in many countries has been lauded as a great capability, but in reality now is certainly not up to the speed of development of some of its commercial rivals. DHL, Amazon, Hermes, all the other large companies that specialize in from strategic supply to the final mile delivery to the door and integration with the customer have operated in a very different way and have adapted far faster than the military, which in many cases is still using a biro, a pencil, paper, a rubber, or perhaps an Excel spreadsheet. It's interesting that also organizationally, in the face of efficiency, some nations have gone to joint logistics. 
this idea that individual services can abrogate responsibility for logistics delivery to a central provider. Such a central provider ro uses rotational people out of each command to fulfill its needs and ensure that priorities are given where they are. But the underlying problem with such organisations is that their responsibility is abrogated to a central organisation where people generally don't have any ownership for the problem beyond the three years of their tour. It is something that is worth looking at across the wider picture of contractualization of defence. Since 1996, governments and militaries have increasingly employed contractors for supply and logistics support. The rise of dedicated service providers for military deployments has reduced costs for militaries, making the use of commercial entities increasingly attractive in the face of financial austerity. From 2003, for a variety of reasons, states have started using private military contractors in tasks from force protection, embassy, FP and deniable operations. There are a few signs this trend is reversing. Indeed, it seems to be a core part of any military mission planning that now envisages a role for private military companies. For some states, these roles have become essential as military expertise in those areas has been deleted under austerity or cutbacks. Yet commercial providers and private military companies operate under a profit mandate, not one that prioritises the mission or the outcomes. These organisations also have a more limited risk appetite than regular military units. Recompense for services for them is often in proportion to the risk the units face. This might have been satisfactory in an area of counter-terrorism or counter-insurgency, but as states refocus on great power competition and high-intensity conflict, there are signs that the contractualization of defence has perhaps gone too far. The three groups of students who tackled uh, this topic came at it in very different ways. One looked at NATO's POL supply chain and efficiencies that may be made there in a short-termist policy recommendation. A second group looked at a far more ambitious uh, view of whether Europe should develop its own large federalised private military contractor. And finally, the third group looked at outsourcing as a trend. They're all very interesting presentations, but the one on the EU um, federalised capability is certainly the one that demonstrates the most intellectual curiosity and uh, conceptual interest. So good morning, sir. We'll uh, present our work. Uh, I will deal with uh, the first part, uh, abstract and summary of our essay. And then uh, Vincent will uh, share with you some reflections regarding the post-COVID crisis analysis. You can see here the abstract of our essay and the three main uh, sections. I will not deal with uh, the first one, which is uh, the approach to contractorization is very historical and uh, clear enough uh, not to be uh, presented here. Uh, the second one um, is more critical and uh, is about the effectiveness and evaluation of um, our current model of uh, contractorization and uh, external outsourcing. Um, our main idea is to say we are stuck in the middle of the Ford uh, going uh, toward uh, full externalization, outsourcing or contractorization, or moving back uh, and uh, getting some uh, procedure in house and keeping it uh, in order to be resilient and uh, effective. Uh, our point of view our, on assessment is to say, uh, reviewing the doctrine and the keywords, portability, reversibility, reactivity, uh, that consequences are not so good for the world system uh, of the defense and the armed force. Uh, we are uh, noting some uh, side effects on the structure, like loss of skills or autonomy, and on operation with uh, creation of dependency uh, to other means, like uh, strategic airlift or so on. The third part uh, could be a, a global uh, proposal to address uh, this uh, 
kind of weakness of the, the pattern of uh, outsourcing. We are suggesting to be inspired by the banking system. Uh, after the 2008 crisis of subprimes, uh, the banking system and the financial uh, system, sector uh, have um, set up some um, comprehensive uh, assessing stress tests, uh, putting some uh, side of their uh, system under pressure uh, in order to note uh, the re resilience of the, the banking sector. Uh, the main idea is to provoke a, a shock uh, on the system and to measure impacts uh, in order to assess uh, consequences. Um, in this stress test, you need a, a set of risk exposure, a scenario, a pattern describing impacts and uh, incidents on the system, and a measure of uh, impact. So we think uh, we can transpose it, uh, and it should be desirable uh, to the armed forces uh, being focused uh, on uh, some uh, subsectors uh, in the armed forces. Uh, we think it could be done first with a strategic airlift uh, transportation. Uh, we have talked about it with uh, the, our comrades. But uh, we think uh, some stress tests should be set up. Uh, and we, we can uh, put some indicators, uh, such like uh, the cost, the availability of aircraft, or uh, the cost per ton, the cost per flyer, uh, the freight, the amounts uh, freight uh, shipped by year or the ratio between civilian means and military means. It could be very interesting to um, uh, jolt and shock some part of this uh, process uh, in order to see uh, what could uh, lead uh, in a downgraded uh, environment. Um, the, the, the idea of the stress test is to achieve uh, to uh, a good steering of the processing of outsourcing and uh, in a reasonable way to keep efficiency and to avoid loss of uh, autonomy. I will let the floor to Vincent uh, just to make a, a quick focus on the post-crisis uh, analysis. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so, uh, thanks to the COVID, COVID crisis, we could wonder if this uh, crisis was a good stress test for the armed forces. Um, and so, we will focus, uh, first of all, on this question, and then uh, we will focus on the fact that we can uh, draw uh, some uh, lessons learned. So, first point, this COVID crisis uh, was a realistic stress test or no? Uh, we can say, no, it wasn't really. Uh, for two reasons. First of all, because uh, this crisis was mainly regarding civilian uh, society and it was mainly a political matter. Uh, so this crisis can only com be considered as a partial stress test for the armed forces as we were not uh, engaged as a front line, uh, we could say. Uh, indeed, armed forces had to support the civilian healthcare system, but the state was never really endangered. Consequently, armed forces were uh, tasked only uh, to get some support, to get some partial help, but was not really uh, the main matter. And in fact, uh, armed forces had to carry out their own uh, current or usual missions. Uh, and it was, uh, by the way, the, the means and the declaration of the French uh, state defense, uh, home defense, sorry, um, speech. Uh, armed forces had to continue to carry on their own mission in, uh, for example, uh, military operations in, uh, in foreign countries. This was the main point. The uh, second one, we can focus on um, the, re the resilience operation, which was launched by uh, Macron, President Macron in, uh, on the 20, uh, 25 of March. Uh, this operation was really dedicated to support uh, and focused on reinforcement to the civilian structures. For example, we can remember that uh, the, health, uh, the health military service uh, set up uh, an intensive care uh, hospital uh, in the east region of France, eastern region of France, sorry, but it was just um, a, a little support in, uh, in addition of uh, civilian structures. Uh, we can think, we can remember too that uh, military were uh, detached to some uh, other ministries like Health Ministry or Homeland uh, Security Ministry. 
Um, so in fact, uh, the military support was more consisting in uh, help for planning, medevac uh, of COVID sick people by military assets, or providing some equipment, uh, mainly in uh, French overseas territories, for example. However, we can still get some uh, lessons learned. We can still draw some lessons learned on this uh, crisis. Uh, even if, uh, regarding my pr primary comment, sorry, uh, it was not really a, focus, a crisis focused on a military problematic. Um, so first of all, um, I, I have uh, two points, two main points. The first one is that uh, in the armed forces, still, yeah, in the armed forces, sorry, three months after the starting, the, the beginning of the crisis, the situation is not back to normal. And this is a major point. Uh, for example, we can speak about support, which is not back to normal, like in catering, in uh, transportation, in mandatory uh, telework, uh, which is still uh, the base, uh, the, the, the orders, or uh, in delays, which are the troops rotations on the operations. Furthermore, there are, uh, this uh, crisis showed, uh, proved the limits of the armed forces. These ones were obvious, and uh, as we could only provide uh, a limited support, uh, we can speak about the um, strategic or outside cargo. Uh, I just would like to remember that to make come uh, masks, for example, to uh, France, we had to, uh, to uh, get a, a market a tender with um, a Geodis company, civilian one, so which gets a tender with a Russian company to get some uh, masks uh, through uh, Antonov uh, 126 uh, one. So we uh, obviously a lack of capabilities. Furthermore, this crisis proved that contractorization might provoke a loss of skills and uh, some cyber, uh, cyber vulnerabilities, for example. I would speak about video conference like today, which are uh, led by uh, civilian means like Zoom or Skype. Uh, for example, uh, French armed forces had not enough uh, um, software, uh, dedicated software or, uh, or computers or whatever to uh, carry out this, uh, tel uh, this um, telework. And so we had to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, sorry, to rely on uh, civilian systems. So these limits were still uh, were significant too regarding training. Uh, we can uh, speak about Elidax company, which is uh, the one providing some helicopters for the uh, basic training of uh, young French pilots. Um, in, in the contract, this Elidax company has to be uh, in capability of providing 36 helicopters per day. And during the crisis, they were only uh, capable to provide six helicopters. So in fact, now we have more than one and month half of delay in the training of our uh, pilots, and it, it will not, it will never be uh, catch up. So to conclude, uh, we can uh, hope, and uh, uh, we can hope that this COVID period may be a great opportunity for the armed forces and politics uh, to reevaluate the contractorization doctrine and its implementation. Thank you very much, sir.